See that school over there? Those kids come from a high poverty, high immigrant population speaking over 17 languages. And it's no wonder that they have difficulty speaking English, let alone knowing their reading and writing skills. They don't even know their basic math concepts. Word has it that this school is the lowest school in the state of Hawaii, or probably one of the very, very lowest, and has been for some time. Would you, as educators, would you sanction this school under No Child Left Behind? There just is no hope for them. Good afternoon. Welcome to Palolo Elementary School. In 2003, the question was, what are we going to do to help our school survive and not be closed down? After meeting the challenges within the school in two years in implementing best practices and dealing with the changes that come with it, as well as tending to challenges within the community, going into the public housing, sharing with the parents, I'm sorry, we need to take your child to school. It is law in America that they attend school. And when anger is thrown at us, meeting the parents saying, listen, the school and the home must work together. And when physical fighting occurs on the campus, driving quickly into the public housing area, going up to the father, shaking his hand before he hits me, saying, good morning, sir. I'm the principal at Palolo. I understand you were fighting on my campus. That is called abuse in America, and it's not allowed. But if you need help, we can have counseling offered to help you. There were many of these challenges that we had to face. And after two years, like I stated earlier, we finally emerged out of restructuring status and became a school of good standing till today. But then, then in 2007 and 8, reading scores reached a plateau, and students started to express themselves, we love our science classes, but not the other classes. But the most important impact at that time was the knowledge and awareness of global warming and climate change, and the devastating effects on food, water, air, medicine, and natural resources. So the question now became, how will our students, their children, their grandchildren, survive in the future? What future is there? The school immediately turned towards STEM engineering process. For those of you who are unaware, STEM is a combination of your science, technology, engineering, math courses. And we incorporated that process. We drew up topics of global problems. Teachers had the freedom to choose which topic they wanted to concentrate on with the understanding that they would write up unit plans and incorporate project-based learnings into their plans to engage students to go further in solving problems uh, and finding solutions to solve the problems. Kindergarten chose the rainforest. And because we couldn't go to the Amazon, they brought the Amazon onto the campus and used hot compost. And in the classrooms, the teachers created terrariums with miniature rainforests. And one terrarium was used to teach the kindergartners the water cycle and the layers of the rainforest. These are students who never had preschool. So when you visited the kindergarten classroom, as all classrooms, students now had to become teachers. The kindergartners would teach you, the visitors, about the water cycle and use the academic vocabulary and understand the vocabulary, evaporation, condensation, precipitation. The other terrarium was used to help them to observe, which they hardly did in their past experience, and now they learn to observe polluted water versus polluted water and its effects on a rainforest. Grade one was, had such a passion for a clean environment, and so they immediately picked 
pollution. And they went out into the community and picked all the litter around the walkways, the sidewalks, the streets, even into the project housing area. And they returned back to school, and the very students who couldn't stand math and only loved science was using math with their project learning. They used the graph, the bar graphs in, in math to categorize all the types of litter that they picked up. They turned to the English language department and started to use webbing to do and separate all the specific items under each category. Their main project was to compare polluted soil versus non-polluted soil in their plant growth. Their engineering design project, which every grade level had to also accomplish, was focused in on the rainwater from the gutters that they used to water their gardens. We became aware that suddenly we cannot use it. It could contain bird feces and mosquito larvae that can cause dengue fever. So as a result, grade one incorporated water filtration studies as well. Grade two was overwhelmed with the amount of waste products throughout the entire world and said we need to learn to recycle things and they started the green compost recycling anything that once was alive, whether it was animal or plant. And their engineering project was to find a way to increase the speed of decomposition of the green compost. So you see the three black containers there. One container of the green compost was put in the sunlight. One container was constantly filled with water daily and a third container was put in the area of a natural environment. And they discovered the container with water is the one that decomposed the green compost at a faster rate. What you see here, too, are students for the first time. Instead of bullying one another, they're starting to learn collaboration. They're starting to learn to work together, to share ideas, to come out with different perspectives, and to be able to deal with diversity. Behaviors, inappropriate behaviors, started to decrease in the school. Third grade was concerned about the lack of food because of climate change. So they went right into gardening, and they used a the vermicast worm juice. And they realized that it might be harmful to human consumption. So they switched over to just using the casting of the worms. They also used hydroponics and knew how to create the liquid needed for hydroponics. And their gardens grew abundantly. But all of a sudden, it died. And that became their engineering project. The students themselves did extended learnings and created their own hypothesis. So as you see, they erected strings around the perimeters of their gardens, and they hung empty soda cans that would make sound if the wind blew. They put tiny little windmills that would have motion with the wind, and the round discs, the CDs, they hung on the sides that reflected bright lights. The lights were so bright when the sun rays hit it, and it focused in on the gardens. And lo and behold, in a short time, the garden started to come up abundantly. And they were so proud, their hypothesis was correct. The birds were stealing their seeds. <laughs> but anyway, the extended learnings that resulted from students working with students, planning, coming up with other ideas, this was seen here. In grade four, they were concerned about the environment and they went right into aquaponics to produce their pro produce. They used a tilapia fish. And the background of our students, when we started all of this, they spoke to you in one word sentences. They didn't know much formal English. Now, when you visited them, the fourth graders would be able to explain to you and teach you, the visitor, about the nitrogen cycle. 
they would be able to articulate with you, discuss with you, and even carry on a conversation with our adults that came on campus. And this was something that never occurred before. Their EDP engineering project was to find a tubing that would release the fish water with an equal flow across the entire surface of the cinders that were holding the plants in the container. And in so doing, they discovered that it prevented mildew and fungus from growing on their crops. You see the boy holding his fish print. If any fish was found outside of the container, it was given to the art class. <laughs> Jiotaku fish printing. And after that, it was given to grade two for their green compost pile. <laughs> grade four was also very concerned about the shortage of medicine that was occurring. And so they created medicinal gardens using all kind of plants from Hawaii and worldwide. Ultimately, what they wanted to do was to compare the molecular structure of diseases with the molecular structure of the substance of the medicinal plants, if they could see if there's any patterns. And what we really wanted to happen in time was to have the students themselves articulate with students across the entire world, every state as well, so that students with unbiased minds can articulate on possible solutions for global problems for their future world. And we were hoping that in so doing, if that could happen, peaceful ties would finally be developed between nations. But anyway, uh, I'm gonna move on now to grade five. Grade five started off with underwater robots and there, purpose was to obtain water samples from different areas and analyze these samples for bacteria count as well as, as well as turbidity. But halfway through, they changed their mind and they went into alternative energy. So you can see that they created solar cars using solar panels. And the wheels came from all the bottle caps from home. So mom and dad must be wondering, where's the cover to the Clorox bottle and so forth? And there, they were exposed also to compressed hydrogen as energy in the fuel cell car. Their PD project, engineering design project, was to create a 3D model that would show how they would power this model by their choice of alternative energy so most of the students constructed houses made out of cardboard and chose either electricity, hydrogen, water, uh, wind, geothermal to show how they would give power into the house. One student created a solar run wheelchair and I put my order in right away. <laughs> I said, I'm gonna need that in 10 years or 15. Uh, with fifth grade and with all the grade levels, you could walk into any class. You would not be able to tell the difference between a gifted, talented <coughs> student or a special ed student or a regular ed student or an ELL student. There was no category in the classes. All students were taught the same. They were expected to collaborate on the same activity. And because of that, Every student in every class experienced some form of success. It, it was something to see. Besides the grades K to five, we also had a science club. The science club focused in on using microbes, natural farming. Paloa means clay. And in clay soil, nothing grows unless you're fortunate to have earthworms that will aerate the soil or give nutrition through their castings. So the students said, let's give more life to the soil. And after learning about microbes created through the Korean technique, they embedded them into the soil at the school. 
Microbes, unlike the regular agricultural process, you don't need a wait time when you harvest. Neither do you need to plant a rotational crop to return nitrogen back to the soil. With the microbes, you can have dead soil and it will give life to that soil. And this is what the students realized. If you have live soil, it will continue to give life to it. So they embedded the microbes, and by golly, they came out with five-pound sweet potatoes. What you're looking at is a three-pound potato only. But there were some that we actually weighed, and it was five pounds. So with all what is happening from kindergarten all the way up to fifth grade to the uh, science club, all of the energy expended from the students was also calculated on pedometers. And the total calculation was given to a corporation who in turn gave us funding for so much if we reach a certain amount. Here's funding to continue your sustainability efforts. So we knew at this point that our students were able to sustain life if anything happened to Earth. And in 2011, during APIC, the Asian Pacific uh, Economic Convention held in Hawaii, we had many visitors from dignitaries to regular people, legislators. Mm -hmm. Malaysia sent five huge groups to the school to observe. We also had people from Office Naval Research in Washington, D.C., as well as people from Korea came by and many others. And they made comments that we were very much unaware of. They stated, my gosh, these students are learning standards on a high school and college level. We were stunned. Honestly, we were stunned because we were focused only on what the teachers were doing. The teachers would start on the grade level with a standard. And as the students started to want to stretch their learnings, the teachers did not stop them and say, you must stay, stick to the standard. The teachers allowed them to extend their learnings in all content areas. The role of the teacher then became a facilitator so that the teacher had to help connect all where they were traveling back to the standards just to make sure they had understandings and then released them again and allowed them to soar. When that second cycle occurred, all the rigor, quadrant D learnings, extended learnings, habits of the mind developed in a natural way. The engineering process just came. You didn't have to plan for it sometimes. It developed naturally, just like natural farming. Things come naturally. For the teachers, they had to adjust. It's hard, those of you who are educators, I think you would understand, it's hard to let go. But as they let go, let go of the students, they realized as the students soared higher, they didn't have the background knowledge. And they felt kind of uncomfortable until they reached the point, like it was stated earlier. They learned to learn along with the students. And only if they have inklings of where the students were going, then they had time to prepare for higher levels of learning. Students, on the other hand, the self-esteem, being able now to speak to strangers, speak to professors, speak to the first lady of Malaysia, the legislators, kids who were so afraid to say one word and spoke in grunts and groans, uh, their self-esteem you could just see blossom. Their yearnings to learn was so evident. And most important, besides behavior changes, the students finally had goals in life. When we used to ask them, what do you want to be when you get older? Oh, I'm going to hang out with my brother. I don't know. Now, what do you want to be when you get older? I want to be an engineer. Miss, I want to know more about the wind turbines. I want, to, I want to be a scientist. Parents, for the first time, came forward and approached some of our teachers and said, teacher, 
my son want to be engineer, how I help, how, how parent help. Parents are starting to want to be part of the children's education. So it was, it was something beautiful to see. And we knew that they'll be fine, the kids will be fine. But the next question, or the last question was, what happens now? We knew that as they left elementary and started to head towards the middle school, they would be exposed to nanotechnology and biomimicry. And as they went further into high school, the academies of STEM with microbiology, forensic science, justice system, culinary arts embedded with chemistry is what they would face. But most important and most concerning was that one day we knew they would reach the following topics. These topics, as it was stated earlier by another speaker, as students start to learn about this, and some already are facing it, when they go deep into knowledge, if the knowledge is abused, they will become aware that they can destroy a lot of things on Earth. They can eliminate species from the Earth, as well as nations off the face of the Earth. But if they know that when they get to this point, if the knowledge is used the way knowledge should always be used, then life can be enhanced. Environments can be sustained as well. So it is hope that as our students reach this threshold of knowledge, that they have in their background the elements of ethics, what they ought to, to do, and what they ought not to do. But most important, have and protect that freedom of choice. The choice to say, stop. We need to protect all forms of life, whether it's animal, plant, or human. We need to protect all forms of environment, whether it's on the earth, in the ocean, in the atmospheres, and beyond. I'd like to close my talk now with a few words from our beloved astronaut from the state of Hawaii, Ellison Onizuka. Every generation has the obligation to free men's minds from a look of the new world to look out from a higher plateau than the last generation. Thank you and aloha.